Sunday morning, a lot going on. Now, the visual aid for this morning is something that I don't know if any of you <clears throat> older folks would even know what it is. So I didn't even bring it in. At this time, our children will be dismissed. Our children are going to go downstairs with our children's workers, learn about Jesus. And as they go out, it's really a, a, a something that if you're a computer literate, you would know what it is. I should have brought a little screenshot of it anyway, but I didn't. Um, so it's a button on the computer. So you got to put your mind in front of a computer screen, since I don't have this button with me, and you think about an application form. Or a student, you think about that homework assignment you're responsible for turning in, and you have to do it online. You go online, you get to the right website, you click the application form or whatever, you complete it, fill it all out, and there's another button you have to press in order to send it so that it gets accounted. Um, what's that button say? What does it look like? Oh, we got some people that know, some teachers and some students. The students know what it is. It's a submit button. It says submit. And what it means is, I am submitting my homework assignment that has been given to me by you under your authority, and I'm submitting it back to you. You so that you have the authority to grade it, to look at it. If it's an application form, you hit that submit button. You're saying, I'm coming under the, your authority for you to review that and then to follow through with whatever it is you're applying for. So, submit button. It's not a lot of fun when it's gray. And if you own the computer, you know that means it ain't working. You've left out a field, something important that you got to click on. And you click, 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 and it ain't doing anything. You're like, what's wrong with this? I can feel your frustration. I can understand that. I can go with that. So this morning, we're in what book of the Bible? We are in the book of Ephesians. Who is the author of the book of Ephesians? God, God is the author. What earthly man did God choose to write through? Paul. That's right. Now, did Paul start the church that was at Ephesus? No, but he had been part of that fellowship for about three years. And he's writing a letter that is a circular letter that would go to all the churches that was in that region. This morning we're all going to do a few verses. Because this morning it is the one of the most controversial verses in Scripture. And when you preach expository like I do, you don't get to skip those hard verses. Or you don't get to misuse those hard verses. So we're going to look at them. Um, now I will tell you, wives, do not get upset with me and send me a bunch of emails this week. You just tell your husband to make sure he's here next week. We can only focus on one at a time. So if you've been with us, you know that the book of Ephesians is about being saved by what alone? By faith alone. You cannot add to anything to bring salvation upon yourself. You are saved by God's grace and by His grace only. So if you've been with us in chapter 1, it was the gospel story, what we need to know. Chapter 2 was our personal story, what we need to tell. Chapter 3 was about the gospel mystery, what it is to see. And then, our pers and then chapter 4 was our personal ministry, what we are to show. If you got your hand out, if you didn't get one, you step right outside the door on that tray. There are some of these. We will be uh, going over there. You'll hear the, get the answers here shortly. If you were here to miss last week, you already got the answers in this one. Last week we started chapter 5. Chapter 5 is our personal mission. What it is we are to do as we go. So we are to go. Uh, we are to be imitators of God. That's a big deal. Imitators of God. What does it look like to imitate God? If you missed that message, that's last week. It means that we walk in love. Number two, we walk in light. Number three, we walk in wisdom. Now, when I say wisdom, I'm not talking about worldly wisdom. I'm talking about godly wisdom. The wisdom that God gives you. Remember James? God, writing through James, said that any of you who lack wisdom, ask and I will freely give it to you. So we have a bunch of people that I encounter throughout the week that I really wish would be praying, God, give me your wisdom. Because it seems like they don't have any wisdom. But you can have it. It's free. It's opportunity for you. So last week we walked in wisdom. And in walking in wisdom, God says that we are to redeem the time. We are to understand God's will in our life. And then the key was letter C, being spirit Field. Lots of Christians are not spirit filled. Now that's not to do anything with salvation. When you're saved, the Spirit of God comes inside of you to live inside of you. But it's your job to fill the Spirit. How do we fill the Spirit? It's the same thing as growing in our faith. Growing in Christ. What are the three things we have to do to grow in our faith? 
Study his word. Study, not read it. Study it and then apply it to our life. What else do we have to do? We have to pray, talk to him, fellowship with him, listen to him. And it's okay. You can go to God with all your woes, all your troubles, all your concerns, all your excitements. He's a big God. He can handle it all. He wants us just to come to him. So we talk to him. We read his word, study his word, apply his word to our life. What else do we do? We fellowship with other believers. Oftentimes, the best place to find him is in the church. Not always, but often they're filled with a lot of people who love the Lord, who are growing in their faith. And iron sharpens iron. We hang out together. We talk about our faith. We talk about what God's teaching us. We share that with people to encourage them. So we walk in wisdom being spirit filled. Remember, that word in the Greek means that it is a continual everyday process. If you do not study the word of God, you quit talking to God. You stop hanging around with other believers to be challenged in your faith. You will dry up and you will be one of those bitter, angry, hostile Christians who want to blame everything that the church does as being wrong. And everything that Christians do is being wrong because you think you know better than everybody else. See, those are people who say, I don't need to go to church. I can, I can worship God anywhere. Well, that's true. But he said, don't forsake the assembly yourselves together because see, there's something about community. There's something about camaraderie. There's something about togetherness. It's a battle that we face and we do it great when we're together. Isolated and alone is what the enemy tries to do. If you ever watched any of those nature channels, which most of you know that I grew up loving those channels, especially Mutual of Omaha, every Saturday morning, I would forsake riding my motorcycle in order to watch the lion or the wolf separate the prey, find the weak, and then pounce on it and kill it. I'm like, oh, man. See, that's like reality TV in its original form. <laughs> no actors. Nobody got paid a lot of money. <laughs> it was just people watching these animals do what God created them to do. That's the way the enemy is. He's like a wolf. The Bible even calls him a wolf. He comes in. He tries to separate the sheep. tries to find the weaker ones so he can destroy them. <laughs> Church does a good enough job. We let the enemy in there. It becomes very difficult. So we are to be praying. We are to be spirit-filled. We make music in our heart. We give thanks always, and we submit to each other. Now, remember, I said this is a very controversial passage of Scripture. I don't want you to come in here thinking this morning about what you think you know what a word means. Because understand that in the original Greek, in the context of what was taking place religiously, spiritually, socially, and economically, our words change. We have a perfect evidence of that. I'm a generation that we change words. My dad's generation, if they said something was bad, it was not good. My generation, if it was bad, it was what? Woo, that's real good. That's bad. This generation, they got all kinds of stupid words. It's just the way it is. Society, we change, we adapt, we take something that our parents didn't like or did like, and we change it. And then we make fun of them for using it the way they used to use it. Uh, then they don't know nothing. They ain't with it, you know? But this passage has also been used. In my heartbreak of heartbreaks by men and church leaders as spiritual abuse. And we're going to set the record straight this morning. So husbands, if you're here without your wives, you want them to hear this. You may not want them afterwards. But I mean, after I get done preaching, but you really should want them to send them a text now and say, hey, you need to watch this message. I want you to be prayerfully this morning asking the Lord to speak lovingly to you through his word. And that you will apply the passages you hear to your life. And live it out. You will not have any better, greater understanding of God's grace until you're living it out. It's not about head knowledge. It's about heart knowledge. If you've got your Bibles open to chapter 5 of Ephesians. Chapter 5, we're going to spend verse 22. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us this morning. We thank you that we can celebrate you in every part of our life. We thank you that you believe in us, you entrust us, and you want to work through us. We pray right now that the enemy tries his hardest to distract us, try to get us focused on other things that we got to do today. Help put a hedge of protection around us that our mind will focus on you and your word. We pray that your word comes to life in our mind's eye, that we understand it, and then we will be courageous enough to apply it to our life. If we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Look at me in verse 22, chapter 5. Wives, yep, this is an instruction from God to you. Wives, do what? Yeah, see, we don't even like, we don't even like that word. You didn't even want to say that word. <laughs> Submit to your own husbands. Now, I am very glad it says your own husband. Don't be submitting to the neighbor's husband. No, no, no. Submit to your own husbands. And it's amazing. He even tells us how. How do you submit to your own husband? As to who? 
Oh, yeah, that would get a little tricky. See, now you got to remember the verses before this. We were talking about being spirit filled. Women, wives who are spirit filled believers, you do not act like the world. You are to love each other, respect each other, and submit to each other. Matter of fact, if you look back at verse 21, what does it say? It says, submitting to one another in reverence of God. See, that Greek word here is a military origin for submit. It is not forced submission. And I'll tell you that churches have used this to force submission. That is not what this word means. It comes from a military origin. It means to voluntarily put oneself under the authority of another. And you do that because of who they are and what they have. Now, when I was in the military, I didn't really know we had voluntary submission. I thought it was mandated dictation. You did what you were told without questions asked. But then I started remembering as I studied this passage the last few weeks that, oh yeah, you know, I do have that friend of mine who was in basic training with me, went to our regular unit together, and then decided he was tired of the military, so he just left. He had no permission to leave, but he left. He was voluntarily submitting to their authority. Now, I don't know where he's at now. He might still be on the run, or he might be in, in the a brig. I don't know, but... He just left because he voluntarily had the opportunity to leave. We were not in cages being hindered from being able to leave. We voluntarily submit to another. Now, submission is not oppression. Submission is not oppression. What does it mean to submit? Biblical submission in marriage is the position of the wife desire to follow the husband's authority in a loving response as she yields to his leadership. Now, I was saving this quote for last, but I want to go ahead and get there right now. That as we go through these passages, I want you to understand. God says, wives, submit to your husband. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, wives, you have to obey your husbands. There's nowhere in there. So don't ever think that your husband has the right to dictate to you, to mandate to you to obey him. That's not what scripture says. It says submit to his authority. What does that mean? Well, well, I don't let me jump ahead of myself. I got some notes here. I got to stay focused or I'll jump way ahead. And then I have to backtrack. What does it mean uh, uh, for submission in, in a biblical marriage that the wife willingly follows after the leadership of the husband? It is an attitude that says, I am glad when you take responsibility for things. I am glad when you lead, especially when you do it with love. I know we in America do not like the word submit. We don't like it at all. A matter of fact, we often think that it, 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 that it, that it means something that it doesn't. Some people think that because a wife is to submit to her husband, that she is to be a slave to her husband. That is not what it says. It's a voluntary act of submission. Putting yourself under his authority. Being raised in a free society as we are, we teach our kids. And we've heard our kids. I guarantee you some of you have heard this or said this as a child, rejecting and rebelling against submission. You ain't the boss of me. I know. Some of y'all still saying that. You ain't the boss. Who died and left you in charge? See, we know how to combat submission. We don't like it. Why do two people, this is the answer for you to answer. Why do two people get married? Love. Love. Stephen, am I a little hot? Because I'm feeling like I'm about to explode these monitors up here. You might want to turn me down a little bit. Because when you get to exciting stuff in the scripture, I get a little passion. I get a little loud. So I'm already restrained from how far I can move and still be on the Facebook Live. So we get married because of love is what we say. Now, I have been preaching this for the last number of years that we do not fall into love. What do we do? We what? Work. We work at love. If somebody's important to us, we work at demonstrating they're important to us. We use those words, I love you, because we're working at love and we don't fall out of love. Instead, we stop what? Working at love. It's funny how we'll stop working in love with somebody, but we'll start working on love with somebody else. But I'm not here to meddle this morning. I'm here to set the record straight. In Jewish time, it was not about love. 
Marriage was very seldom ever about love. It was a contractual agreement between her father and his father. They had expectations. Now, it's funny that Judaism had the highest ideal and expectation of marriage, and yet they had one of the lowest ideals for women. Women were treated as property. They had no rights. They could not divorce their husband, but the, the husband at any moment could divorce the wife. And in the Roman Greco world, it was even more crazy than that. A man could divorce a wife today and marry somebody else this afternoon and divorce her tomorrow morning and marry somebody else. There's a record of somebody married 21 wives in 30 days. That's insanity. But see, that's the craziness that the world brought into the most sacred agreement between a husband and a wife that God ordained. But understand, the enemy has always, always, always tried to take what God created and pervert it. The perversion is always wrong. What God has called is always great, right? And there's a reason behind that. There was a long morning prayer that Jewish men quoted. If they were a faithful Jewish man, they would quote, quote this long prayer. I'm not going to say it for you. I'm going to say one line of it. It says, thank you, God, that you made me not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. See, only a Jewish man can pray that prayer. And they did this often. This is what they were taught as little kids to be praying. How sad it is. See, that was their culture. But I want you to understand. What their culture said was okay. What their society says was acceptable was not God's standard. Was not acceptable to God. He was not. He is not. And he never will be in a position of putting women in that particular role. He created women with a desire for them to be a helper to the man, the, the husband and wife were to be a team. Now, in the early days when God created Adam, he gave him this assignment, he got it, and, and Adam worked. And then God said for the first time in Scripture, it is not good for man to be alone. Everything else in creation, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. Oh, it's not good for man to be alone. He created us to have companionship. He wanted to be all that we needed, but he looked at man and realized man needed something else. So he Put him into a deep sleep. And what part of the body did he take? Rib. Took a rib. He didn't take a toe bone. You know, she's not to be put under your foot. Didn't take something out of the head. She was not to be your leader. Took it out of the rib because it's supposed to be your helper. A helper is someone that has equal rights in a relationship. At all times. Now, I remember growing up in the South, we had this women's uh, rights activist thing going crazy in the, must have been like in the 80s, early 80s, crazy. And my pastor said, yeah, they come by the church one afternoon because we had church Sunday morning, Sunday night. And in between that time, they stopped by the church and they want him to sign this petition about giving women rights. He's like, I can't, I can't sign that. My wife won't give me permission to sign that. I can't sign that. <laughs> See, he knew and understood that his wife was the helper in that relationship. And she was wise. And she would help him to see clearly. Uh, behind every good man is always a what? See, y'all heard that before over and over and over. That is true, too. Let's go back to the role that women play. Jesus' ministry when he walked on the earth. Jesus created everything there is, including man. Including woman. So what does Jesus think about women? Well, let me set the record straight here. In Luke 8, it mentions that many women followed Jesus. They felt drawn to him. They had no problem submitting to him as their Lord. As Jesus treated women, he treated them with grace. There is never an example anywhere in Scripture that Jesus wasn't treating women with anything except grace. John 8, you might remember the woman caught in adultery. The men didn't bring the man. They brought the woman caught in adultery. How many people did it take to have adultery? What happened to the man? Well, he's a man. He can do what he wants to do. But the woman. And the law said she is to be stoned to death. That's what the law said. A woman caught in adultery should be stoned to death. What did Jesus do when they brought her? And they probably brought her naked because they caught her in the act. Throw her down in front of people and said, Lord, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. What do you think we should do? What did Jesus do? Because Jesus does not have to submit to man at all. He doesn't have to submit to He bowed down, got on the ground, started drawing stuff with his finger. I sure would like to know what he was writing. 
Some people speculate he was writing the sins of all these men standing around. And Jesus said to the men, he who is without sin, do what? You cast the first stone. Thankfully, None of them lied to themselves and said, I'm without sin. They realized they were sinners condemned unclean. And they all dropped the stones and walked away. Jesus looked up and said to the woman, where are your accusers? She said, I have none. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, Jesus responded with grace because he loved. When we love, we respond with grace. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Wives, I want you to understand your husbands are going to mess up. I know your wives are going to mess up. But needless to say, you need to treat her with grace. How about uh, Jesus' response to the woman at the well? Remember that story? Samaritan woman in Samaria. The disciples who oftentimes, because of the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, they would go around Samaria. But at this time, they went through Samaria. Jesus sent the disciples in to go get some provisions. And he stood, stayed around this well. And a woman at noon, they came out. Women didn't draw water at noon unless they were ashamed, embarrassed, or didn't want to communicate with the other women. Because see, at the well, is like at work, at your cooler, your water cooler. What happens at the water cooler at work? Yeah, I've never worked in an environment like that because, you know, I have an office. And I, sometimes I have a secretary there. Oftentimes the secretary's not there. And I don't have a water cooler to go to and talk to anybody. So, but I've heard, because I've watched programs, where that's where the source of talk starts. Sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it ain't, but it's gossip. Jesus is at the well where the gossip would have been going crazy in the morning, but this is at noontime. She comes out and she draws the water and he asks her to give him a drink. Now understand, women, I mean, men did not talk to women. Jewish men were to be above reproach, avoid the appearance of evil, were not to talk to women alone ever. Now, don't even get me started about the Samaritan thing. Samaritans were half breed. They were half Jew and half Gentile, and they were outcast by both societies, both the Gentiles and the Jews. These, this woman was a Samaritan. She had been married five times, and the person she was living with was not her husband. And she asked Jesus, you being a Jewish man, why do, you, why do you speak to me? And the disciples, when they came, they saw him at a distance, talked to a woman, and they marveled, is what the Bible says, that he was talking first to a woman and second to a Samaritan woman. He's breaking two society barriers because society says it's unacceptable. Jesus, who created all of us, who looks at our heart, he knew that woman needed salvation, and he offered it to her, and he told her that if you drink from my water, you'll never thirst again. And she, most theologians believe, understood what he meant after that matter but of time, and she went to her business and told everybody about Jesus. That's what happens when we get saved. We get excited. We don't tell people what happened to us because we're changed. We're no longer saved. We've been bought by a price and that price was great to the Father but it was done because of the love of the Son for you and for me and Him being obedient to the Father. So Jesus spoke to the woman at the well breaking down not only social uh, barriers but racial and sexual barriers. Jesus is one of my heroes because I can picture Him being the rebel of the day. <laughs> he went against all the social norms. Folks, in American society, those who love the Lord are going to have to stand on God's Word and it's going to go against society what they say is normal. If God says it's not, then it's not. We don't need to have a committee get together and say whether it is or not. We know it's wrong. It doesn't matter if it's another denomination, another church. It doesn't matter if everybody sanctions it. If God says it's sin, then what is it? Sin. That's right. And we can't change His mind because He has declared what it is. Women were the first at the tomb. And they were there with a broken heart. They were going to anoint the body of the Lord. He was not there. Women were the first to proclaim the resurrection of Christ. In the early church, there were deaconesses, there were prophetesses, there were even couples who ministered together. You might remember Aquila and... See, you know, couples that ministered together. They had respect for others. They are in the Bible. Paul sums up in Galatians 3.28. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
God created woman to be equal to man and companion of man to be the helper for man. Because see, even God knew man needed help. We need help. We always have needed help and we always will need help. And he created woman. Now in this dignified, elevated role of women, Paul goes on to talk about wives submitting to their husband. So why should a spirit-filled wife submit to her husband? Because she understands that it is God's plan first. And that God only wants the best in her life. She can trust God as she follows as God and as she believes in Him. She will willingly, voluntarily place herself under the leadership or the authority of her own husband. He is not suggesting, God is not suggesting, Paul is not suggesting that Husbands are better than wives. On the contrary, they have different roles. We all do it, whether we want to or not. Everyone submits. Jesus is our example, right? We are to follow his example. He submitted. I'm going to give you four cases of his submission. Number one, he submitted to his earthly parents. He had respect for their role and he voluntarily submitted himself under their authority. Number two, he willingly, voluntarily submitted to his heavenly Father's authority. John 8, uh, 29, Jesus said, I always do those things that please the Father. Number three, Jesus submitted himself to other people. In Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Number four, the ultimate submission was when he laid his life down for everyone else. Romans 13, 1 tells us that let every soul be subject or submit to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that existed are appointed by God to rebel against those authorities or to rebel against God. He laid his life down in submission. But that's what love does. In verse 23... Chapter 5. Let's see. Did I get all the points on that? Oh, your handout. Walk in submission is number 4. A, wives to husbands. Number 1, as to the Lord. And number 2, here we go. I skipped that part, didn't I? As husbands are the head of the house. You know what it means? And that's in verse 23 here. That's where we're at. For the husband is head of the wife. As also Christ is head of the church. And Jesus is the Savior of the body. His body is the church. Headship, what is that? It's a noun that means the, the position of a leader, the head, the one in charge. Just like the church having God-ordained positions of leadership that we talked about a few weeks ago, so does the home. The husband is ordained by God, man. If you're a husband, you are ordained by God, responsible to God for your leadership in your home. It all falls back to trusting God and God's leadership for knowing what is best for the marriage. Now, you know what that means? Men, as husbands, you and I will be held in account of how we led our household. That doesn't mean we're a dictator. That doesn't mean we have to initiate everything. I'll tell you, women are far superior to being spiritual than men. And, and, and I don't know if it's because of the way we're created or what. But we, as men, as husbands, are going to take the brunt of the responsibility from God when we stand before God. So you better make sure you check yourself out and that you are in submission to God because that's the first and foremost. Don't be worried about your wife submitting to you. You love her. You want the best for her. She will willingly follow you. Just like in leadership. You know, a leader who's a true leader, people will follow a leader who gets up there and tells you he's a leader and dictates to you what to do and tells you to go while he sits back, nobody has respect for him, nobody's going to follow him. A leader is the one that leads in the battle. The leader is the one that says, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what we are seeing in our home. Submission. To talk about submission, we've got to answer the question, what, is, what a submission is not? Because this is where society, this is where churches, this is where men have stepped up and I'm talking about ungodly people trying to use scripture for their own benefit. Submission is, does not mean you will agree with everything, but that you will respond because of love 
in a respectful way to honor the Lord. Not to honor the husband, to honor the Lord. There's a difference. Submission does not mean putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. If the two are not in agreement, guess who you are to follow? <laughs> it ain't the husband. It's to follow Christ. He'll always be right. Um, submission is, does not mean that the wife is to respond out of fear to her husband. That's abuse. If the husband tries to lord his position over her and command her to be a servant, then he has not met the requirements that God has placed for him to be the head of the house. The recognition of the husband and his de love deserves and encourages her. She will want to submit. He should never tell his wife to submit. So wives, if you live in a situation your husband brings this passage up, he says, you have to submit to me. You can call me up and I'll pray for him, for you. But then you make sure he tunes in next week because... In order to have that submission, there are qualifications. That's next week. So wives, don't leave here today having your husband say, Yeah, woman, you need to submit to me. Ah, uh, no, we no, no. You better not play that card. We're gonna go to the next week. Next week we're gonna find out what, what the men are to do. The wives voluntarily submit submission arises out of her own submission to Christ, first and foremost, as God has called her. Verse 24, last verse of the morning. Therefore, just as, what is the therefore there? Talking about husbands are the head of the wife. Just as Christ is head of the church. Keep that in mind. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ. That means that the, uh, member, the, 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 the church submits to Christ. We submit to Christ. We follow after Christ. So let wives be th to their own husbands in everything. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is her husband, and the head of the church, uh, the head of Christ is God. As mentioned earlier, even Christ submitted to the Father, willingly following the leadership of the Father to, to a blessing of the Father for the Father. We as the church, we submit to Christ as our leader from a voluntary heart out of love. I gotta point out again, women, wives, nowhere in scripture are you. To obey your husband. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all going to go home and look this up. Some of you are watching online already looking it up. Well, I'm going to prove him wrong. Find it. Show me where wives are to obey the husband. It ain't in there. I've heard it in marriage vows. It ain't in the scripture. Scripture says to submit. That does not mean obedience. If your husband tells you to do something that is contrary to the word of God, you are not to be obedient. I think God left that in there on purpose so that there is a loophole. If they're not following Christ, you don't have to submit to them. Mm. Christ demonstrated his love that, that through dying in our place, he demonstrated his care for us that we could not get aside for him. He acquired it for us, demonstrating his harsh desires to give us, the church, his best. He wants us to give our best to others. He, Jesus always lifted up women. He always supported women. He always counted women. God always encouraged women, supported women, endorsed women throughout Scripture. Society did not respect women. Society treated women poorly. But God never has. Don't ever let somebody tell you they can't fall after God because of the way things used to be. No, society was like that. When I preached through the Old Testament, I pointed out everywhere that God used women, elevated women, approached women to be used by him in a good way because he demonstrated his love for them. Men, you are created with a desire to provide and to protect. It's your responsibility to provide and to protect. If you are to provide and protect, that's not just finances. That's not just uh, 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 material things. That's spiritual leadership. That's emotional support. That's mental love. It is investing in them because you care about them. And let me tell you, man, you treat your wives like she's a servant. Somebody down the road going to treat her like a woman and you're going to lose her. We have proved it over and over and over. God tells you to love her like he loved the church. What did he do for the church? He laid his life down on the cross. 
You should be willing to lay your life down for your wife at any moment. If somebody were to come through our doors with a gun, every husband in here should be tackling him. Now, you know the rule in our church. Go down to the ground because we've we got armed people that are going to take him out. We're not going to hold him down and give him the opportunity to give his heart to Jesus. We're going to send him to Jesus. So you just get down out of the way. We're going to protect you because as your spiritual leader, part of my responsibility is to protect you, provide for you, so we got people in place to do those very things. But the husband... You should at all times, if you're out on a date, if you're out eating, you should desire to protect your wife over your own life. And I'll tell you, I've met men that will lay their life down for the country, but not their wife. Heartbreaking. Wives, the Bible is very clear. Submit to your husband voluntarily because of his love for you. Demonstrate it in his actions and speech to you. But before you can really submit to him, wives... Before you can really fall after Christ, husbands, it starts with giving your heart over to Him. Following something simple as the ABCs. What does A stand for? Amen. Admit you're a sinner condemned unclean. All of us are sinners condemned unclean. Without the grace of God, we would not have forgiveness. Without the forgiveness from God, we would not have eternal life. Without Him coming and living inside of us to empower us, to lead us, we would not have what he, uh, the best is that He has for us. The gifts that He gives us, the blessings He has in store for us, we would not have. Without following him. It begins by admitting that we're a sinner. And men, I know that's tough to admit you've done something wrong. It's tough. But we need to. We need to. Women, we need to admit that we're sinners condemned unclean. What's B stand for? Believe. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, came from glory down in this earth, died on a cross, and rose again for you and me so that he could send his help, the Holy Spirit. If you believe, then the last part of that is C. What is C? Confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart unto salvation. God looks at your heart. Once you do that, you invite Jesus in your heart. There's no magical prayer. You can come forward in this hymn of invitation. I will pray with you. I will give you words to say. But it is not words. It's your heart. Your heart should be reflecting something like, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner condemned unclean. But by your grace come into my life, forgive me my sin. Let me live for you. God looks at your heart. The Spirit of God will come into your heart. At that moment, you will be transformed. You will be changed. But then, you have to follow through. What's one of the things we do once we give our heart to Jesus? We did it this morning. Baptism by immersion. Baptism means to identify. Jesus didn't need to be baptized for uh, an outward expression of the forgiveness of sin. He was baptized because baptism was identifying. So he was identifying with a group of people. Who is he identifying with? Everyone who gets in the water and gets baptized by immersion, identifying with him. And that's John the Baptist when he was out there preparing the way for Jesus. People come, they get baptized. Jesus come along, he had to decrease, so Jesus could increase. People get baptized by immersion to identify with him. So those that were baptized this morning were identifying as followers of Christ. What else do you do? You start studying the Word of God. You start praying. You start listening. You hang out with church fellowship. Hang out with people that love Jesus, that want to talk about Jesus. Grow in your faith. Share Him with other people. Tell them how you're different. Share with them the importance of what Jesus wants to do in and through them. If you buy Him, close your eyes. We're going to have a hymn of, of invitation. If God's dealing with you, don't put Him off. You come up to me by the hand, we'll pray. If God's uh, uh, directing you to this uh, to be a church home, we'll pray. If God's directing you to give your heart to Him, we'll pray. If God's directing you to, that you want to be baptized, we'll pray. Whatever God's dealing with you, if you want me to pray with you, I will be up here. You know, don't wait for somebody else. They may be waiting for you. You be the one that's filled with courage. You may be a wife and saying, I just need to kneel at the altar and ask God to forgive me from some, some things and that I need to have a, a heart's desire to willfully submit to my husband. Maybe a husband needs to come and kneel at the altar and say, Lord, forgive me for not being the man you've called me to be, the husband you desire me to be, and help me to live the way you desire me to be from this point forward. You can talk directly to God. You don't need to go through me. We just want to rejoice with you. Father, I just pray that you move mightily as your spirit moves amongst us. Encourage us, love on us, and help us to be courageous to take those challenges or the conviction and to go forward with it. For we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing as we sing. If God's still